From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Dallas Peterson will discuss the herbicide options for controlling that flush of weeds in wheat stubble post-harvest. He'll go over the product combinations that have shown to be the most effective in K-State's independent field trials. Dallas will be followed by K-State's A.J. Sharda. A.J. talking about the performance of a new advance in field sprayer technology. Based on the field trials he's conducted, the Pulse Width Modulator Spraying System. It's designed to greatly improve the consistency of product flow across the sprayer boom. And later on this week's horticulture segment where K-State's Ward Upham looks at the reasons behind subpar garden vegetable fruit set in this summer heat. All that straight ahead on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. The wheat harvest in Kansas, not quite fully complete, but very nearly so now. And with the abundant moisture we've seen in the state this year, it's no surprise that we've ample and then some weed growth in that wheat stubble post-harvest. And it probably deserves some attention, our guest will tell us now. Dallas Peterson is with us once again, weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. And the strategies for dealing with weeds and wheat stubble have changed a bit, Dallas, and we'll talk about that. But the flush of weeds, pretty substantial, isn't it? Well, as you indicated, we do have a pretty good crop of weeds in a lot of our wheat fields. And it does vary, of course, from field to field and and where you're at in the field. But a lot of our fields got planted late and we're kind of late developing in the spring. And with all the moisture, uh, the weeds have come on. And plus, we had some drown out areas and some poor spots in the fields. And we always have weeds in those areas. Uh, where there's openings. That's uh, weeds seem to take advantage of open space. And so uh, as the wheat now has uh, matured and we've harvested it, again, that opens things up. And so what's there is already taking off. And what's not there with all the moisture, we're going to continue to get some more f- flushes through the summer. And one presumes it's the usual suspects out there. Yeah, we probably have some mare's tail and kochia that probably came up earlier in the season. Uh, the mare's tail is done coming up probably, but uh, what's there is going to be difficult to control. Uh, the kochia. We'll continue to get some kochia, but the big one in the summer, of course, uh, is Palmer amaranth, along with some of the grasses like crabgrass and, and foxtails. And of course, as we go later into the summer, then we'll have the volunteer weeds starting to come on. So again, it's always a variety of weeds at different stages, which does make it quite a challenge for control. For years, Dallas, the stock answer against weeds and wheat stubble post-harvest Well, it was a combination of products, glyphosate and 2,4-D, which worked well up to a point. Certainly, and glyphosate probably carried the majority of that load, to be honest with you. Very broad spectrum uh, in control as far as grasses and broad leaves, very inexpensive. Uh, We added the 2,4-D and oftentimes dicamba to it to to maybe boost up that broad leaf weed control. And we especially did that, say, 20, 30 years ago when glyphosate was really expensive, and we wanted to maybe go with a little lower rate, and so we we added the 2,4-D and the dicamba to it. We kind of got away from that, to be honest with you, when glyphosate got really cheap and we went with some higher rates, and that probably contributed to, to some of the resistance issues uh, that we've developed now. So, again, glyphosate-resistant palmer amaranth and kochia and mare's tail are all present in a lot of those fields. We can't rely on the glyphosate for control of those species anymore. In many cases, uh, the 2,4-D and dicamba are not doing the job either. 
partly because in many cases we let those weeds get way too big for them to control. So, uh, again, we've got to maybe rethink, you know, our approach. That treatment's no longer working. It has no residual activity, and so it's not going to provide any control of subsequent flushes. Uh, It seems like the last couple of years in western Kansas, it rains every other (laughs) week. And so we've gotten those multiple flushes of weeds, and again, it gets expensive if you continue to have to go out there and treat uh, for control. So again, we need to look at some alternative treatments and some different strategies maybe as we move into the future. And we'll speak of those options, but uh, blanket observation here, one needs to get on these as early as possible before they get out of hand, yeah, it, especially, it, as, as far as growth stages. Right, concerned. especially those weeds that were present when we harvested. We've cut them off. Uh, they're going to be tough to control. One thing we do have going for us is that we're not limited on moisture. Uh, weeds are always more susceptible when they're active and growing and not stressed, so that's a good thing. <laughs> But again, they're still in an advanced stage of growth, and that does make them difficult to control. And again, glyphosate used to control those big weeds. It just doesn't do that anymore. Well, to the alternatives then, and what options jump off the page right away to you in as far as their effectiveness? Well, again, for those emerged weeds, uh, one of the alternatives is Gramoxone or Paraquat. Paraquat has a lot of baggage that goes along with it in terms of being toxic uh, if you happen to ingest it. But if you handle it with quick care, uh, there shouldn't be any issues with that. Paraquat is is non-selective like glyphosate, so it's pretty broad spectrum in general, although it tends to be better on broadleaf species than in grasses. And again, especially if the grasses get bigger. One of the keys to getting good weed control with Paraquat is coverage. Uh, It requires adequate thorough coverage because it's contact. It's not systemic. So that means probably at least 15 gallon per acre carrier, if not 20 gallon per acre. Uh, You also want to add adjuvants to it to make it work properly, either a non-ionic surfactant or an oil type of, of adjuvant. And where you can, it also is beneficial to tank mix it with atrazine or metribuzin. Those are photosynthetic inhibitors. They have kind of a synergistic additive effect when you use them in combination with Paraquat. So we tend to get better uh, long-term control with those tank mixes than where we use the straight Paraquat. And if you can't use those because of your future cropping plans, then it still is beneficial, I think, to tank mix those with either a 2,4-D or dicamba to get a little systemic activity uh, in that treatment uh, to hopefully prevent the regrowth that sometimes occurs from the axillary buds following a paraquat application. There is another product line that gets talked of as a possibility here as well. It's called Sharpen by brand name. Yeah, Sharpen uh, has been out for several years now, although relatively new compared to Paraquat, uh, which has been out a long time. Uh, Sharpen also is primarily a contact herbicide, although it does have some residual control as well. Again, with any of these herbicides, they're going to be more effective if the weeds are are still small and actively growing and not so big. Like uh, with Paraquat, Sharpen also needs the appropriate adjuvant to work best. And the best adjuvant to make Sharpen work is the methylated seed oil. So, again, for the mare's tail, uh, for some of the other broadleaf weeds, uh, Sharpen is an alternative. The higher the rate you use, probably the better control, along with better residual. Sharpen can can be used anywhere from like one to three ounces per acre, but you're going to get better activity at two and three ounces and better residual out of that than with the lower rate. The lower rate mostly kind of burned down, but even then, again, just not quite as effective. So that definitely is a, an option. And again, you're probably still going to have some benefits to tank mixing it with other herbicides, whether it's the 2,4-D dicamba or glyphosate. Sharpen doesn't have a lot of grass activity. So tank mixing it with glyphosate still has quite a bit of benefit. Can it be also mixed with Paraquat then for effective it control? It could be mixed with Paraquat. And that would probably, again, you get some additive effect between the two plus some added residual from that Sharpen component. Now, the one tank mix I didn't talk about with Paraquat that we probably should address a little bit is glyphosate. Mm -hmm. That might seem like a natural tank mix, again, because Paraquat's a little weak on grass and glyphosate's good on grass and we don't have much resistance to grass yet. 
The problem being that when you tank mix those two, you get severe antagonism, that is reduced control, especially out of the glyphosate. So unfortunately, tank mixing paraquat with glyphosate is probably not a very good option. There is another class of herbicides that might be considered as well, as you point out in the recent e-update article on this topic, flumeoxazin, and what's the prospect there? Yeah, and that primarily would be for extended residual control. Again, as I mentioned, uh, sometimes, especially the last few years, we've had quite a bit of moisture in western Kansas, it seems like. We've had multiple flushes of those pigweeds uh, and the kochia, but especially the pigweeds. And so that would be one that we could tank mix uh, really with any of those products uh, for extended residual control. Now, it does have some foliar activity, but I don't think you can rely on it uh, only if the weeds are less than two or three inches tall. Uh, But the advantage of using a flumeoxazin type of product is the residual control and especially the pigweed control. Uh, again, there's a range of rates that can be used. Uh, primarily, we'd be looking at two to three ounces, and the big difference that you see there is the length of residual control that you're going to get out of that treatment. So uh, in most of those cases, I probably would lean toward the three ounces just from a efficacy residual weed control standpoint. Uh, that's a herbicide that we've used in soybeans for many years, uh, primarily under the trade name of Valor. Uh, so we're familiar with it. We just haven't used it in the wheat stubble very much because of the cost. Well, the cost has come down here in the last two or three years. So, uh, again, that makes it uh, a lot easier to swallow. All of these choices and their performance, of course, covered fully in the yearly chemical weed control for field crops guide out of K-State. So reference that. But Dallas producers should set realistic expectations with their weed control program here, should they not? Well, that certainly is the case. And again, we got spoiled when glyphosate was still working. It would control big weeds. A lot of these are not going to control the large weeds nearly as well. Uh, Again, even though some of these do have residual, uh, there is a limit to that, too. It's not going to last forever, and we don't want it to last forever because we want to keep our rotational options uh, open as well. So the key, I think, with most of these is weed size, and especially with the contact herbicides, we need to have that adequate coverage. So a minimum of 15 gallon per acre, really preferably 20 gallon per acre for the Sharpen and the Paraquat type of treatments. Well, by all appearances, we've several open days ahead, so this would be a great stretch of time to get the jump on these post-harvest weed outbreaks in our wheat stubble out there. Dallas, many thanks as always. All right. It's been my pleasure. Dallas Peterson is a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today will be back in a few moments on the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. tuned in to agriculture today and welcome back well in the field of precision agricultural engineering here at k-state a number of exciting things are happening now and we want to take this occasion to report those to you today aj sharda is with us once again research and extension precision agricultural engineer at k-state and aj every time you come by you've something new and and highly interesting that producers will want to be in tune with as well here One of the things that we'll share today was actually presented at a recent gathering of your peers from around the nation, the Society of Agricultural Engineers, and you've been doing work with what are called pulse width modulated spraying systems. And before we talk about what you've been looking at, you might reacquaint us with those systems and what they're about. Yes, Eric. So uh, the pulse width modulation systems, or PWM, which uh, people know them more commonly, are cylinder actuated systems on each nozzle and these systems are designed 
to be set at a certain application pressure because uh, we all know that whenever we go out to apply any product, uh, that product label has a has a specification in terms of the droplet size, which is the target of that application, and then the application pressure, uh, which is tied to the the nozzle you pick up for that specific application. So these systems, what you do, you set it up, you set your sprayer up for that application pressure, and the cylinders on each nozzle, they have two things uh, about it. One, we call it as a frequency. The other, we call it as a duty cycle. The frequency is how many times they open and close in one second. Most typical systems are 10 hertz systems. That means they will open and close 10 times a second. That means there is a 100 millisecond cycle of this happening. And within that 100 millisecond time, the percentage of the time those solenoids stay open is what we call as the duty cycle. Now, the duty cycle dictates what will be the instantaneous flow rate out of that nozzle. Now, with this capability on hand, I can start to put in what is the individual speed of each nozzle on my spray boom. Based on the speed, I know what my application rate is. All I have to do is modulate that duty cycle to vary my flow rate to get to the right application rate on the field scale. Now I can do that on a nozzle by nozzle basis instead of the entire boom. And that has enormous possibilities in as far as efficiency of application. The question you've been tackling has been, though, making sure that there's a consistency in that application, and particularly with respect to droplet size, you say. Absolutely. Um, this was probably our the, the first and foremost uh, objective of our study was that if you use a system like this, how consistent these systems are in managing those pressures across the field when you are doing all sorts of control demands, whether you are doing speed transitions, whether part of the nozzles are going completely on versus off uh, in terms of section control, which happens you know, on areas which have already been sprayed or areas which do not need any application. So that was our prime goal because I'm coming back to the same goal that we want our droplet size to be consistent because it is what the label says that you have to achieve that and it is tied to my application pressure because we have fixed orifice nozzles most of the time. There are some variable orifice, but for all those fixed orifice nozzles. So that was the biggest thing. And like I said... In the past, we have done a lot of work with flow-based systems, and we have seen that those pressure goes up and down all the time because in flow-based systems, as you go faster with speed, you have to put out more product to keep your application rate matching, and that can only be achieved by uh, increasing the pressure. Mm -hmm. So if I go up on pressure, I increase chances of driftable fines. If I go down on pressure, I have more coarser droplets, and my coverage can be impacted. Therefore, you have tested this system out recently in a series of formal field trials to quantify the uniformity that you're seeking here, and this is what you reported to your colleagues across the nation here recently. What have you found out? Yes, uh, Eric, this was this was a dream come true. Let me tell you first <laughs> that, because we, coming down from Ob and from my liquid application work, we really wanted to do this work for a long, long time, and thanks to uh, CNH and, you know, for giving us... Uh, Case New Holland sprayer. It's a 120 foot boom sprayer uh, with Raven um, PWM flow control system. Uh, we have a bunch of farmer cooperators. So we picked up two fields. There was a, uh, one was a 130 acre field, and there was a 140 acre field. And we just finished this study, so more results are going to pour in. But in these two fields, uh, we went out, we did some typical application rates, we, we tried to maintain some typical application pressure. But the big thing, here's, a, here's the moment of truth we were, <laughs> were waiting for, is that these systems behave way better than what we have seen in the flow-based aspect. By a, a large margin? By a very large. Um, we can safely say they are twice as good in terms of maintaining the application pressures and, and consistency in flow rate on a nozzle-by-nozzle -nozzle basis to match the application rate. Because 
we were not doing very good on some of the older systems. Now, we have to be very cautious how we say twice as good because those twice as good as from some of the fields which were very tough fields, lots of irregular field boundaries, you know, a lot of field obstacles like, you know, telephone poles, sinkholes, um, grass waterways and all that stuff. If you pick up a completely rectangular field where you have to go back and forth at a constant speed and everything is on, you won't see much of a difference. And that's the place where you don't maybe need this technology from an investment standpoint. But how many perfectly rectangular fields are there? It depends on where you are in Kansas, but they may be very few. That's exactly the point here is that we have lots of fields which are highly irregular in field boundary shapes and there are terrain differences and and there are, we have seen a lot of grass waterways and so all sorts of things happen. So if you see a lot of those things happening, this is where we saw that tremendous improvement in terms of consistency and pressure from uh, from left side of the boom all the way to the right side of the boom and also managing of the flow rate from a nozzle by nozzle basis. Very interesting findings in this ongoing work on the performance of the pulse with modulated spraying systems out there. Looking forward to the next round of results from this work. The other thing we want to mention briefly, AJ, something else that your program will be undertaking with the support from a major farm equipment manufacturer, you'll be looking into precision planting and a system which in some ways is trying to accomplish the same thing only with seed placement, the objective here. Yes, we are very, very excited about this project uh, funded by John Deere. The bigger goal is we have been working around with precision planting system for the last couple of years. In this project, we're going to look at some of the latest and greatest technologies coming out on the planting systems. We really want to put a lot of information in, in the hands of the producers in a manner to really understand what these technologies on each row unit are doing for them to accurately place the seed at the right depth, right spacing for all the seeds to emerge as uniformly as possible and give every plant an equal opportunity to optimize on the yield potential. That's the bigger goal. The thing is we are, farmers are slowly but surely getting more and more comfortable in driving at speeds faster than they are traditionally used to driving, which is five, four and a half, five miles per hour. Not quite road gear, but getting closer. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And uh, so if we we start planning at seven, eight, ten miles, which is a very comfortable speed for some of those systems, can we give farmers a lot of information that irrespective of ground condition, irrespective of ground cover, irrespective of, you know, what the soil texture and soil resistance is, that these systems can very accurately get the right depth, place the seed, cover it up, and make sure that all the seeds will will emerge uniformly. That's that's a bigger goal in this um, in this project. Another thing is the new liquid application control system, which is uh, the nutrient aspect. Uh, nutrient products, uh, where do we place them? Mm -hmm. Can we maintain the rates on a row-by-row basis? So there is another um, new technology which might be coming. So we we want to see how good that is and what are its capabilities to manage rates on a row-by-row basis. Well, this project is very much in the opening stages, and we are eagerly awaiting the results of it as well. Again, looking at precision planting systems for seed placement uniformity for liquid fertilizer placement as well. Exciting work that's unfurling here at K-State out of the Biological and Agricultural Engineering Department. A.J., the best of luck with continuing all of this. Thanks for the update right here. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. That's A.J. Sharda. He's a precision agricultural engineer, K-State Research and Extension, reporting there on several of the precision agriculture project undertakings in motion right now in his department. You're listening to Agriculture Today. And we'll return shortly on the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. 
Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test, fix, save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Glad to have you back. Eric Atkinson here. And moving on now to today's agricultural news headlines for you. These courtesy in part of DTN. President Donald Trump has again warned that the U.S. could hit China with tariffs on another $325 billion in goods. The president said during a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, and quoting him here, we have another $325 billion that we can put a tariff on if we want. As for China's pledge to buy U.S. agricultural products that Mr. Trump touted at the G20 summit in Osaka, he stated, again quoting, they are supposed to be buying farm products. Let's see whether or not they do. From China's side, Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhang Shang told reporters that U.S. and Chinese negotiating teams have stayed in contact, labeling cooperation on trade with the U.S. as a mutually beneficial situation. Meantime, U.S. and Japanese officials are working on a small trade deal that would involve agriculture and autos, this according to Reuters, citing three unidentified industry sources familiar with those talks. The deal could be agreed to by President Trump and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in September in New York. That pact could involve Japan offering U.S. farmers new access to markets in return for reduced tariffs on Japanese auto parts, according to this report that cited an auto industry official. U.S. officials have been seeking increased access for U.S. beef and pork products, as those two sectors are being negatively affected by other countries inking deals with Japan that give them more favorable access to the Japanese market. The USDA is forecasting higher meat production, especially in pork, while predicting no big changes for dairy production. Here's more on that from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA Chief Economist Rob Johansson says the July report is forecasting an uptick in meat production across the board. Overall meat production at 105.9 billion pounds in 2020. That's up from 104.5 billion pounds in 2019, so slightly higher production. Meanwhile, hog prices coming down, even though we did see the run-up in hog prices following various news stories about African swine fever, but also due to the lifting of tariffs to Mexico exports. That's occurring more slowly than anticipated. So we did bring our prices down slightly. Turkey prices are expected to recover and rise in both 2019 and 2020. Outgoing World Ag Outlook Board Chair Seth Meyer points to one reason for an increase in hog production. What we did get is a reported pigs per litter that I want to say was 11 pigs weaned per litter. That's not born, that's saved or weaned. That was a record large pigs per litter. And it was a bit of a surprise. This month's USDA report on dairy did not elicit much excitement. Almost no changes to speak of in terms of dairy production this month. We did make some small changes on the import side on a fat basis and exports on both a fat basis and a skim solids basis. Johansson notes a small expected increase in dairy production. Prices pretty much up year over year in 2020 relative to 2019, except for way overall all milk price up in 2020 year over year at about 65 cents per hundred to a total of 18.85 per hundred weight. Meyer has more detail about the lower weigh prices. Pretty weak weigh exports despite favorable prices. So some of that might very well be related back to trade. So it isn't necessarily a purely a price-based decision, uh, a pure price competition on the global market. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And kudos to three Kansas State University faculty members in the Animal Sciences and Industry Department who were presented prestigious awards by the American Society of Animal Science at that society's annual meeting in Austin, Texas recently. Swine scientist Bob Goodband receiving the 2019 American Feed Industry Association Award in Non-Ruminant Nutrition Research that recognizes an individual who's contributed to and published outstanding work 
in the past 10 years. Also, K-State's Cassie Jones receiving the 2019 ASAS Early Career Achievement Award, recognizing an individual who's shown outstanding achievement as a young scholar, Cassie an accomplished researcher in the area of animal feed safety, and K-State's Casey Olson receiving the ASAS Animal Management Award, which recognizes an individual who's contributed to excellent research in the biological or production management of livestock. Our congratulations to Bob, Cassie, and Casey. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Here's Greg Akagi. Heather Fisher is joining us. She is a first grade teacher at Manhattan Catholic Schools. And Heather, you recently participated in the Kansas State Summer Soybean Science Institute in Manhattan on the campus of Kansas State University. What were some of the things, and I guess what got you interested in wanting to be a part of the three-week teaching session in the Summer Soybean Science Institute? Well, I'd seen other teachers' social medias that had shown pictures from past years, and I thought it looked kind of interesting. And honestly, I was not a person who was very passionate about teaching science. I just did it more because I had to. So I thought it'd kind of be a good thing for me to do. Plus, the Soybean Institute offered a stipend, which usually teachers have to pay to learn. And so that this was kind of a respect thing and made it more enticing to do. So I just decided I'd try it. So coming out of the teaching time in the month of June, how do you feel about it now? My students are going to have a much better year in science because I'm excited about science. I've learned so much about not only soybeans and science, but just about how to teach science and how to get kids excited. So it's been a great experience. Was it interesting in the aspect to learn about soybeans, as they put it, from pod to plate and and really being hands-on in in some of the things that you were able to do during that time? It was. When I went into the class, I pretty much didn't know much at all about soybeans other than they make milk and oils from soybeans. So I've learned so much about all the products they make, and I've seen how they breed the soybeans. I've learned about the parts of the plant and all that farmers go through to try and have a good yield each year. I was amazed by the technology and all that goes into it to really get the good yield. You talked about the stipend to help you out during that time, but also monies for uh, classroom supplies too. We got some great classroom supplies. We got an iPod touch that with a magnifying lens so we can go out and take close pictures of things with kids and show them the detail. We got microscope that hooks to our computer so we can put it up on a board and show them details, grow light, all kinds of planting supplies. Very generous. The Soybean Commission is very generous. I was really thankful for that. That is Heather Fisher, a first grade teacher at Manhattan Catholic Schools, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg and Coggy there. Thanks, Greg. We'll be back with this week's horticulture segment here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Coming your way next on Agriculture Today, our weekly segment on horticultural matters. And with us once again is K-State Research and Extension horticulturist Ward Upham, who is hearing from growers a question that basically pops up about this time every summer, talking about vegetable gardens now, Ward. And that question is, why aren't my vegetables fruiting? They've been thriving, producing foliage, growing but no fruit. And uh, there are multiple answers to this, you say. There is. And probably the most popular crop we have as far as vegetables are concerned is tomatoes. And so oftentimes people, if they haven't grown them for a while, may not realize that you can over-fertilize them. You can give them too much fertilizer. And when you do that, you're going to get a really nice large plant, but no fruit. 
they put that energy to use in making more foliage instead of making fruit. So be careful not to over-fertilize. Mm-hmm. There are other crops that will react as well that same way. But tomatoes are especially sensitive to that. So just watch your fertilization. Now, will tomatoes finally make that transition at some point, though, and start to set fruit maybe later on if you did over-fertilize at the outset? They certainly will, except you can run into a second problem, and that problem is heat. Once you get night temperatures above 75 and day temperatures above 95, often those tomatoes won't set fruit. What happens when a tomato is fertilized, you get a pollen grain that lands on that flower and grows a pollen tube down to the ovary where it fertilizes it. Well, if you get that hot, that pollen grain dies before it has a chance to actually do the pollination. And so you won't get any fruit until it cools off. Now, you'll probably get a lot of fruit toward the end of the season. Also, any fruit that is already set isn't affected. But starting probably about now, we may get plants that are not going to produce any more fruit for a while. Mm, So we're into that heat, and and that's what to expect. That is. Now, cherry tomatoes seem to be a little bit more resistant to that. And sometimes we'll go through the whole season and have cherry tomatoes. But those large slicers are a little bit more sensitive. Will we also see a slowness in ripening for the fruit that is set in this kind of heat? It sure will. And so what you want to do is wait for what we call the breaker stage. Breaker stage is when that tomato starts to turn color. And so when you start to see some red or even some orange or yellow on that fruit, go ahead and pick it. At that point, it's already really cut off from the vine. All it's doing there is finishing that process by which it ripens. So if you pick it at that point and bring it in in cooler temperatures, it'll actually ripen much faster. And it'll be just as good, just as high quality as if you left it on the vine. Some cases actually be higher quality. Leave it on the vine, you're more likely to get damage from insects or birds, or you may have it crack. And so it's a good idea to pick them early at this time of year. But by and large, for tomatoes, once we work our way out of this extreme heat, they should be okay. They should. Now, it kind of depends on the type of tomato you have. The shorter vine ones may not set as much fruit late in the season as those large vine ones such as Jetstar. Mm -hmm. But still, you should have some fruit that will still be around toward the end of the season. Well, what we call, Ward, the vine crops, and of course, tomatoes are a vine, but we think of things such as cucumbers, muskmelons, watermelons, do they also uh, succumb to this poor fruit set? They do, but usually for a different reason. If you do over-fertilize, you can have some problems. But the first problem you're going to notice is that you have a lot of flowers and no fruit. The reason for that is all these vine crops produce two types of flowers. They produce male flowers and they produce female flowers. And the first flowers that show up are always male. They're 100% male. It just takes time for those female flowers to develop. So how do you tell the difference? So the male flowers just look like a regular flower, has a flower stem behind it that connects to the vine. But if you look at a female flower, it has a miniature form of that fruit right behind the flower. So a little cucumber, a little muskmelon, a little watermelon, you can see it right there. It's not hard to tell the difference between them. So you wait for those to develop and then see if you get fruit. Now, if you don't, then you may have a problem with pollinators. These are bee pollinated. Uh, Tomatoes are more wind pollinated, so we don't worry about pollinators as much with them. But on the vine crops, if you suspect you may have a trouble with pollinators, just hand pollinate some. In other words, pick off a male flower, take off the part that has everything but the anthers, you know, the part that produces the pollen, and hand pollinate some of those female flowers. And if they develop and others don't, then you know you have a problem with pollinators. Mm -hmm. You need to get some bees in there. By whatever device you can. (laughs) That's right. That's right. You can order certain types of bees and bring them in. Well, you can get honeybees, but they're a lot of work. There are other solitary bees that you can buy as well. Very good. Think about that if you need to push those vine crops along. Now, you do get this question that's related. That is, if uh, I have vine crops of different types planted relatively close together, will they cross-pollinate, and will that be an issue? That is a question we get every year. And though technically that can happen, especially if you have different types of squash that are closely related, it's not going to affect the fruit for that year. The genetics for that plant are set, and that includes the fruit. Whatever you plant in seed, that's going to determine what that fruit looks like. 
And so the next question is, well, what happened? You know, I have something that doesn't look normal. And so there are different possibilities. One is that the previous year you did have some cross-pollination, and that seed overwintered and then came up as a volunteer. If that happened, yeah, it could cross. and You could get something strange. The other thing is you may have gotten bad seed. And so if you've gotten bad seed, then you can get something that's a little bit strange. But you'll never – the genetics of that plant is set. Once that seed is formed, the genetics is set. There's nothing you can do to change it. The only vegetable we worry about as far as cross-pollination is sweet corn because we're eating the seed. And then if you get cross-pollination, in some cases it can affect it. But don't worry about the placement, the proximity of those vine crops by and large. That's right. You can put them right next to each other. It's not going to hurt a thing. The only time you worry about them is if you're growing heirloom plants and you're saving Mm -hmm. the seed then you really have to be concerned. Ward, this happens every summer, but we are in that stretch where our vegetable gardeners will need to be patient, stick with their regular management routine, assure that adequate water is available, and let them work through these stressfully hot days by themselves. That's right. A lot of our plants now that are doing that are growing in our vegetable gardens are warm season crops. They can take the heat as long as they have the water. And so just make sure you just follow those practices. And don't panic if, in fact, you're seeing no fruit or little fruit on those plants. They, with everything being equal, should get after it here pretty soon as we weather this dog days of summer stretch. Appreciate your time, Ward. Thanks. You bet. He is Ward Upham, horticulturist, K-State Research and Extension, and that is this week's horticulture segment. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.